bought with a price. Jesus has changed, changed my whole life. Just who, just who I am, tell them, tell them I am redeemed. Love now abides where there was confusion, peace now reigns. I am walking. With Jesus, I'm a child, child of the King, and it's all because I am redeemed. Mm. I am redeemed. I've been bought with, bought with a price. Jesus has changed, changed my whole life. If anybody asks you, if they ask you just who I am, tell them, tell them I am redeemed. I'll tell of his favor. I'll tell of his love. I'll tell of his goodness to me. He purchased my redemption with his own precious blood. And from sin, from sin, I've been set free. Oh, I am redeemed. I am redeemed. And I've been bought with, bought with a price. Jesus, Jesus has changed. Changed. Change my whole life. 
Ah! 
Welcome to your point of contact for the kingdom of God. I greet you in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. I am Dumai A. Harshaw, Jr., uh, coming to you from First Baptist Church, 101 South Wilmington Street in the city of Raleigh, North Carolina. And it is a pleasure to join you in this time of worship as we celebrate the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We believe in God's movement and power in this time and uh, in this generation, knowing that the expansion of the kingdom of God is still taking place today that has been established in the blood of the Lamb and the victory of the cross and the power of the resurrection. And so therefore, we live by faith and not by fear because the word tells us God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so faith means that doors are open and uh, God's provisions are ours simply by the promises of God uh, in the word. And so we stand in that reality and invite you into the same, not only for this time of sharing together, but for your life as well. And so we ask for your prayers, uh, for our ministry. We ask for your support to lift us before the Lord, that God might be glorified that the Lord might give us strength and courage for such a time as this to continue to stand and continue to preach, sing the songs of Zion, and pray in the name of Jesus. And so I invite you to join me uh, as we move toward the cross, as it were, preparing for the message of sacrifice, but even beyond the message of Easter. So we turn to John's Gospel today, and in particular, verse, uh, verses 20 through 33, out of the 12th chapter, John 12, uh, verses 20 and following. We find this wonderful narrative uh, in the events leading to the cross, where it says, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn toward Jesus, told Jesus. Uh, Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless... A kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies. It remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven, uh, then a voice from heaven uh, came, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the application of his awesome word. Will you bow with me in a word of prayer? Dear eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this day of worship and this time of being enlightened by the story of your redemptive love to the human family. Lord, we thank you today that you have blessed us with the knowledge of your word, 
reminded us that you are the God of glory and majesty and victory and pointing us to the way of Jesus Christ who is our Savior and our Lord. Lord, allow your word to live within us and may that word create for us a yearning that we might be in fellowship with thee and know thee, O Lord, in all of your saving grace. For it is in the majestic name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we pray. God's people said, Amen. Amen indeed. This is a story about searching for for Jesus Christ. And it is such a profound uh, addition to the stories leading up to the crucifixion of Christ, but also the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it is unusual in that here in John's Gospel, this story is added in order to uh, speak another message uh, another word concerning how pervasive the ministry of Jesus Christ was then and how it was destined to become. And so we see a very dramatic addition here when Jesus then begins to note uh, to his disciples publicly that he is being offered uh, in order to save the world. He speaks of the imminent death that is at hand and he speaks of the glory of God and what that means. And so that the Greeks represent then in this text and for this time that now God is about something that is greater than just one group of people in one place in the world. But now the message of God's kingdom and the message of Jesus Christ and his love is being pushed to all the known world. And what a marvelous uh, picture that is that the Greeks then come and they are seeking and they go they come to Philip uh, first perhaps it's because he he has a Greek name and so they come to Philip uh, in order to reach out to Jesus Christ and here it appears that the fact they came uh, to join the festivities uh, that were worship experiences linked with the synagogue and uh, the religious order of the day, that they uh, maybe had started their own journey with Judaism, even though they were Greek, in order to, uh, to understand more of the mind of God or the movement of God or what God was doing in the world. There was something within them that craved for, for more understanding of who Yahweh is and what God is doing in the world. But uh, obviously they had heard something very special about Jesus Christ and what they heard only confirmed in their spirits that they needed to meet Jesus, to be close to the Lord, to, to be in his presence, to witness for themselves what God was saying and doing uh, through this rabbi that they heard so much about. And uh, these pointed, wonderful words, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. My Lord, uh, what a marvelous expression that is from any human heart. We want to see Jesus. As if to say we've seen so many other representations of the divine. We have witnessed so many people who talk about their relationship with God. We uh, have learned about so many religious traditions and yet when all is said and done, we would see Jesus. There's a hunger that is displayed in these words for these individuals now who come, only described as Greeks in the text. When they come and they touch base with the disciples, the inner circle of Jesus Christ, in order to get closer to the Master, to press their way through in order to see what God has done in Jesus Christ. And we can see that and understand that that's a perennial, uh, perennial request uh, uh, for so many across generations and across eras and centuries who, uh, who are seeking for peace of mind and seeking for true relationship with God, searching uh, indeed for what is true and what is authentic and what is lasting that this world uh, promises but cannot give. And sometimes it takes an unrest in your spirit in order to search for that which is lasting. 
You get comfortable with what is given by the world and what is offered in the name of God. And yet, your soul's not satisfied. There's still something that is missing. There's something else that you need. And, and we already know, we declare that religion within itself cannot give it. And just words about the Lord are not enough. But there has to be that personal, authentic relationship with God in order to satisfy the longing of a heart that needs that which is lasting, that which is good, that which is true. And we see that these, these Greeks who come are searching for something more. Uh, it didn't appear that they were journalists or reporters coming to report upon the activities that were taking place in this day and time, but rather they were what we call seekers who were seeking something that the current situation, contemporary faith traditions could not offer to them. And how many of us have also had that same kind of yearning in our own experiences with the Lord when we know that the institutional church has failed us when we understand that we've been traumatized by lifeless traditions of organized religion and we need something more than that. We need something that, that reaches deep inside our hearts and our minds, captures our spirits, moves within us and moves us forward in a way that nothing that human beings can do, no money can do it, no education can do it. No entertainment can do it. No human experiences within themselves and alone from the hand of God can do it. But rather, there's something about divinity entering into our spirits and making us over again and recreating the life of God within us. And then there is that sense of satisfaction. Sirs, we would see Jesus. They were looking for something that only Jesus can give. And isn't that what happens with us as well when we grow weary of the world and all of its offering and things from a distance look so good and the grass looks so much greener on the other side and we look at pleasures and fame and we look at money. If I could just get enough money, then I'll be satisfied. If I could just have enough friends, I'll be satisfied. If I could just get enough pleasure, I'll be satisfied. And you and I both know that when you get the money, it doesn't satisfy your spirit. When you've had that experience of excitement and wonderment and entertainment, it doesn't satisfy your spirit. And whatever you get that this world is given, all you want is more because it will not satisfy you because you need something else. It's almost like trying to utilize the resources that are demonic in society in order to take you from the real world into a make-believe world through getting high or some kind of elevated state that only a drug uh, can give to you and then you get that but you can't get enough of it. You want more and more and more until your life is in shambles and everything you love and care about you've destroyed and there's nothing left of your true spirit and who you really are and you're still craving for more because it will not satisfy. And the only one who satisfies like the Greeks understood is Jesus Christ. There's something about the Lord Jesus. And so they come and then this becomes a platform, uh, an opportunity for another lesson that the master would teach as he lays out the reality that, that now his end is coming in the natural and he's been teaching and discipling and educating and providing miracles and support systems and compassion and words of edification for all of those in the time that he lived um, in this form and with his disciples. But then he lets them know that the Son of Man has come to be glorified and what God has done is not just a natural movement for him to become an icon in the world, but rather he is to be the savior of the world. And that what God has done in him is something that's going to last forever. And there's more to it than it appears on surface. And so it's interesting that as the Greeks come seeking, and maybe they were searching in some sense for a celebrity kind of faith leader, 
as we often do in the world, to put people on pedestals and begin to follow them and give them all of our money and all of our allegiance. But Jesus right away enters into the cost of discipleship and what it means to experience the presence of God in a heart and in a life. As he says, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. It's only one single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Well, what is he talking about? Jesus is saying, I am dying that I may give life to many. I'm going to the cross to die for the sins of the world. And as a result of my death alone, others will be forgiven and transformed and empowered in spite of their sinful nature. And yet I will take the path of sacrificial love and death. And then he goes on to elaborate in the 25th verse of that chapter about what it means to follow in the way of enlightenment, what it means to really follow in the way of love, what it means to follow in the way of faith related to what God has done in Jesus Christ. And he says anyone who loves their life will lose it. And anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for life eternal. What is he talking about? Well, Jesus is simply saying, if you really want this oneness with God and to be in unity with the divine, you've got to give something up. And in order to truly embrace all that God wants for your life and all that God has done in Jesus Christ, well, then you have to go through a process of spiritual death in order to make room for the movement of God in your life. You can't hold on to all the stuff that makes you happy. You can't hold on to all the stuff uh, that inspires your flesh and then move on to what God has for your life. But you got to deny yourself and take up that cross. you got to offer some of what your life represents to the altar in order for it to die so that what God has for you can live. You can't have everything that you want and still serve the Lord Jesus Christ because some of what you want is about the flesh, the carnal life, the underside of life, and not about what God has deemed necessary in order to make your life whole and complete. And so as a result of that, Jesus said, let me really spell it out for you. Many people are here because I'm a famous leader now in the community, but I'm interested in those who are willing to have a life change, to have transformational reality in their lives. And for those folk, they're going to go through a process of spiritual dying to the old life that they might embrace the new life. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has arrived. And God is doing it with his own work, with his own hand, by the power of his own spirit. He's creating a new person, a new whole person, a new person before his sight. And that's what is reflected in these words. It's not saying that we should hate our loved ones or hate relationships or hate what the world is doing or even hate ourselves. What it's saying is that you've got to really get serious about the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want a life with God, you've got to be serious. And you've got to do your best to open up every area of your life. It means that you'll lose some friendships and you'll lose some relationships and you will lose some opportunities. But that's all right. God will replace all of that and then some. But in order to embrace, you've got to die. And so if your hands are full of stuff and God wants to give you some, you've got to put that stuff down. That your hands are empty and open for God then to fill your hands and even your heart with something wonderful and something good. And something that reflects the mercy and the plan of God. And then he goes on to say, whoever serves me must follow me. And that's a rough statement because how do we follow Christ? Jesus went to the cross and he died that we might have life. And where I am, he says, my servant also will be. And it means that we have to be about our father's business as Jesus Christ was. It means that you got to focus on the things that matter with the Lord and not so much with the world around you or the world's opinion or what everybody else is doing. That your life will stand out as one who has embraced the cross and you've decided to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 
It means that Christ has already set the example of sacrificial love, the demonstration of the same love. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But then he rose again the third day, and he was glorified by the Father, and the Father was honored. Uh, and so he, he thrust that honor upon his Son. And if Jesus is honored, we're honored too. When we bear the cross, follow him, give up the stuff that is in the way of our relationship with God, surrender our will, surrender our spirit unto God, say yes to the Lord and what God seeks to do in our lives, make room for his glory. Said, I want to see the glory of God. You got to make room for the glory. That means sometimes you got to fast from the things you want to do. Sometimes you have to sacrifice so that then God can move in your heart and in your life. And then immediately the passage switches uh, to this notion of Jesus expressing his humanity, that he was God and man. And he says, now my soul is troubled. And as he, as he just thinks about what's coming next in the great drama that God has written for the plan of salvation, that there's a, an old rugged cross and Jesus will be placed on that cross and nothing will be same with his fellowship with those disciples and he will die as an innocent victim of an unjust system that deems him sinner. And he's not a sinner, but he died for sinners. And he says, now is my soul troubled. What shall I say then? Uh, what shall I utter in this time? Father, save me from this hour? No. He corrects himself for that part of himself that would say, I don't want the bloodshed. Uh, I don't want the separation from God. Uh, I don't want to be deemed a sinner. I don't want to take my place on a cross. I don't want to die and suffer right now. But he says, no, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. And then again, that he just simply lifts up his voice and say, Father, glorify thy son. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy presence in the world. Lord, the glory is thine. Your plan is the best plan. Your plan is the only plan. Your plan is the divine plan. My life is not my own. I was birthed for a cause, for a reason, to bring salvation to a broken world. And now your plan is unfolding. And what? Should I withdraw? Should I try to change your mind? And then upon those beautiful words, Father, glorify thy name, then a voice came from heaven, and God, the Father, is speaking back. I have glorified it. I have glorified my name, and I will glorify my name again. And then it looks like the crowd uh, heard some of that, and they, and they thought that they had heard thundering. When they, what they heard was the voice of God Almighty speaking to the Son of God, reassuring him that the plan design is the best plan, that everything's all right, uh, that they will not be separated ultimately by sin, that Jesus now will represent, that whatever fellowship he lost with those he held so dear would be uh, renewed in the future and it's even going to be better because their lives will be touched by the blood of the lamb and the presence of the spirit of God and the crowd thought that they had, it had thundered others said an angel had spoken to him but that was no angel that was no thunder that was the voice of God and imagine if you ever hear the voice of God you too will wonder if that was lightning and thunder you would wonder if that was the voice of an angel when it's only the voice of God who speaks to God's children, who expresses God's will and purpose. And so then we see that then Jesus said to them, he's back to the mission and the focus in the moment. As he says, the voice was for your benefit. It was not for mine. I know who my daddy is. I know who God, creator God is. Uh, I, I know the plan that I'm a part of. I understand what God is doing for the human world and for, uh, for those whose lives are broken and shattered. 
and oppressed and possessed and destroyed. I know what he's doing, but that voice was for you because now there's going to be a change as we move into a power dynamic confrontation with the powers that be in the evil systems of the world. He says, now the prince of this world will be driven out. Glory, hallelujah. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people unto myself. And he said this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. What an answer for those seeking for Jesus Christ. What a display of the glory of God. What a deep understanding of what God has done in Jesus Christ. What an answer to their inquiry, to their searching. That basically Jesus is saying, God has given you salvation. And that salvation is coming through the cross I'll bear and I'll die on. And through the power of the resurrected hour. And if you want some of that, you can have that. Because I came for that reason. And if you're looking and searching for something eternal, for something truthful, for something authentic, I suggest to you that you'll find it in the person of Jesus Christ. You'll find it in the name that is above every name. You'll find it as you surrender your will to God's will. And simply say as the hymnist wrote, have thine own way, Lord. And if God has God's way in your life, nothing will be the same. Everything will be better. The Lord will be glorified. The Holy Spirit will touch your life. You will be lifted in your circumstance. And you'll be on your way to glory. On your way into the presence of Almighty God in time to celebrate the goodness of the Lord. And we celebrate God's word. And we extend that invitation to you that you too might see Jesus Christ. Do you want to see Christ? Well, then all you need to do is come in faith and offer your life to him. Let us pray together. Lord, we offer our lives to you as the Greeks who came searching, seeking for something lasting, something real, something good. And that is you, O oh Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for bearing our sins. Thank you for dying in our place. Thank you for bringing power to our lives through the resurrection morn. Bless us. Touch the hearts of those who need a second chance. Touch those who need a new beginning. Touch those who need a new life because you are that life and you are that truth and you are that way. In Jesus' name we pray and God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Dearly beloved, we want to take this time to be in prayer for those in need and uh, praying for our church, uh, family, and all those associated with the church and even in the community. There are prayer requests and that we pray throughout the land for those who are suffering and struggle and have needs and searching for miracles and looking for God's intervention. And we base our, our prayer effort prayer as prayer warriors, uh, but also as intercessors on the word of God. And in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verses 18 and following, at the conclusion of the description of the armor of God, which we as believers inherit and have access to, uh, the word of the apostle is, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Keep on praying for 
all the Lord's people. Pray also for me whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador, ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. And as the apostle needs needed prayer, we need prayer as well. So I encourage you to uh, read our newsletter uh, for any updated uh, announcements that didn't have any to add to what uh, we have already shared, but we do have some prayer requests um, that we share with you. We're praying uh, for the family of Patricia Hart Stewart, who went on to be with the Lord and will be eulogized on Monday, March 22nd at Haywood Funeral Home. Wilmington Street, uh, the visitation at 12.30, the funeral begins at 1 o'clock. We pray for the Monroe, Stewart, and Fuller families at the loss of Sister Patricia. Also, we uh, pray for the Carol Troublefield family, the Harold Trice family, the Willie Dunn family. Special prayers for uh, Deacon and Deaconess Arliss and Beulah Newman, Pray for Dolores Wimbush. Also praying for our, our missionary Faye Yarbrough, who is in South Africa ministering. And we think of all those uh, storm victims and COVID-19 victims, and we pray for households that have embraced violence and loss of life as well. Let us continue to remember Beulah Bates, Ozella Burgess, Tyler Day, Pearl Fowler. Doris Bridges Harris, Dorothy Jones, Ellen Powell, Mary Louise Salter, and Margaret Wilson. Will you bow with me in prayer? Dear eternal God, our Lord and Savior, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege, the power of prayer, and even the possibility of prayer. And so we bring these names before you, we bring these families before you, we bring these conditions before you, and we know that thou art able to bring comfort. You're able to heal the sick. You're able, O oh Lord, to minister to those who need comfort today and minister to those who need guidance today. Minister, minister to those who need your leadership and your guidance today. And so we pray, uh, based on your word, that as we pray, you move in a mighty way. Bless us, Lord, uh, with the understanding of your love for us, and let us remember that underneath are your everlasting arms, and you will see us through, see these families through, these individuals through, according to your grace and according to your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you.